In this video, we're going to talk about the first two states of matter we'll cover in this chapter, liquids and solids, collectively known as the condensed phases. Let's start with a general overview of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, we'll first start our discussion by discussing solids. We'll start with their general properties, and then we'll move on to the different types of solids that we see around us. Uh, those are going to come in two forms. Crystalline solids, which have regular repeating patterns in their structure, and amorphous solids, which do not have those regular repeating patterns. We'll have a couple examples of each, as well as the differences and properties that go along with being crystalline versus not. Next, we'll move on to a discussion then of liquids. Again, we'll talk about their general properties, uh, and we'll cover two major properties that liquids tend to have, that one being viscosity, or how thick the liquid is, uh, and the second being the concepts of cohesion and adhesion, how well the substance sticks to itself versus how well it sticks to other materials. Uh, as a quick example of solids versus liquids, we have a picture over to the right uh, dealing with the uh, substance of mercury. Uh, in the bottom picture, we see mercury in its natural state at room temperature, a liquid. Uh, but mercury, like all substances, can be changed into both solids and gases. The picture above uh, is mercury that has been cast into the shape of a fish and then cooled down to very low temperatures, causing it to solidify. We've already gone into the differences and properties between solids and liquids a little earlier on in this unit. Today we're going to go into them in just a little bit more detail. So let's start with a discussion of the general properties of a solid. This should be information we've already seen this unit, but I want to make sure that it's fresh in your mind before we continue our discussion. Uh, again, in solids we see that the atoms are very closely packed together. We have a very regular rigid pattern that is very clearly shown here in the diagram. Uh, and we see this regular structure, which is one of the hallmarks of something being a solid. This regular repeating pattern uh, is what one of the things that gives solids the properties that they have. We have a definite shape and a definite volume. This regular structure we see down here prevents the solid from changing its uh, general shape. Uh, we expect solids to be rigid. We expect them to have higher densities because the atoms are so closely packed together. And we expect there to be relatively slow atomic or molecular movement. This close packing of the atoms really prevents them from moving in any kind of meaningful way. And as a result, they kind of just wiggle in place a little bit. So now that we've reminded ourselves what a solid actually is, let's talk about the two major types of solids we'll be seeing this year. Uh, the first and most common of the group is going to be crystalline solids. Uh, crystalline solids are atoms or compounds that are arranged in regu regular geometric patterns. This is the way we've been talking about solids so far uh, in this particular unit. Uh, the geometric arrangement then at the atomic level often dictates the geometry of the natural crystal itself. So what we're basically trying to say is, is if we look at the shape the atoms form when they're at the atomic level, we should see a similar shape in most cases to what the atoms look like when they're at the actual macro scale level, the scale that we tend to see it at. An exceptional example of this is the substance pyrite, often known as fool's gold. Uh, it has a simple cubic or primitive cubic structure that looks like this. Basically, the atoms arrange themselves in this cubic pattern. As a result of that cubic pattern, we expect to see the crystals for pyrite form uh, to have that same arrangements of atoms as well. The large scale structure of the pyrite has a cubic shape which matches the crystals the individual's atoms form when they group together. These individual groupings of atoms are referred to as unit cells. They are the smallest group of particles in a crystal that have the complete repeating pattern. So whatever the structure, whatever the shape of the overall crystal is that all the atoms form in, the unit cell is the smallest group of atoms that still have that individual shape. Now as you can imagine, there are many different types of these individual shapes. And as a result of having many different types of these individual shapes, we expect to see many different types of crystals formed. Here is the simple cubic crystal that we saw in our pyrite example, but we can see that there are many other different types of cubic structure. We draw tetragonal, orthorhombic, you can go on and on and on with these geometries. And each one of these separate geometries, these unit cells, produces different shaped crystals. And when you see crystals in like a jewelry store, especially ones that have not been necessarily carved, those different shapes that those crystals naturally have, again, often tailor back to these individual unit cells that each of these structures contain. Now, aside from crystalline solids, we also have a second type of solid known as an amorphous solid. The word amorphous meaning without shape. And these are solid materials without that regular repeating power, without crystals. These solids form simply by having the atoms just close together without the regular patterns. A great example of these two types of things would be chemicals like rubbers and plastic, both of which are made with very long chains of molecules that aren't really organized in any particular way. They're all just very close together.
Another common example of these would be glasses, uh, things like we think of regular glass, the silicon dioxide glass that we see in the middle of the picture here, uh, as well as volcanic glass or um, obsidian, uh, which we see over to the right. And obsidian obviously has a lot of historical value. We can see here this obsidian is carved into the shape of an arrowhead. Uh, it was one of the first working materials that uh, Native Americans used in our continent uh, to replace things like wood uh, as a better, sharper cutting implement. So with our discussion of solids complete, let's turn our attention again to liquids. Uh, just like last time, we'll start with some general properties. Uh, in liquids, we see atoms still very generally closely packed together, not quite as close as in solids, but very close to that. Uh, the big difference here between liquids and solids would be the fact that we do not have any of the regular patterns that we see in most solids. The resulting properties then is that liquids don't have the same connected shape that, or the consistent shape that solids do. Because of that lack of structure, they tend to take the shape of the container that they're in as opposed to identifying their own shape. Because they're still packed together, however, we still expect to see a very definite volume for our liquids. We can't be compressed or spread out. We lose all that rigidity for the same reason we don't contain the our own shape anymore. And we see slightly faster uh, molecular atomic movements, but still relatively slow. I would say the movement of liquids and solids are very similar, but a little bit different. Now, instead of talking about the structure of liquids, which doesn't really exist, let's instead talk about some of the properties that liquids have. And one of the properties we often talk about when we're thinking of liquids is the property of viscosity. Uh, viscosity is basically a liquid's resistance to the flow of itself. Uh, so you can imagine pouring a glass of water, the liquid pours very well. Pouring other liquids, it pours more slowly. That's what we're talking about when we're dealing with viscosity. Uh, basically, what viscosity is really a measurement of is the amount of friction that exists between the liquid particles that resist the change of shape. You can almost think of the measurement of a viscosity as a difference, as a measuring of how liquid something is versus how solid something is. The more viscous or the thicker the material is, the more it behaves like a solid. The lower the viscosity, the more it behaves like a liquid. We can also think of viscosity, as I've already used the term, as the thickness of a liquid. And we've already used these two examples. Water has a very low viscosity, and as a result, pours very easily. As soon as it comes out of the container, it basically falls freely. Whereas something like honey has a relatively high viscosity. We think of honey as being a significantly thicker liquid. Uh, and viscosity, uh, much like every property, is determined by a couple of different things. Uh, first off, it's determined by the amount of intermolecular forces present. Now we haven't talked a ton about intermolecular forces, but we've identified them as the forces that hold these molecules together in a liquid. You can imagine if there's more of those forces, the more viscous something is going to be, the more like honey it's going to move because those particles are going to have a lot of friction as they try to move against one another. It's also determined by the shape of the size of the particles, and viscosity is extremely temperature dependent. Generally speaking, higher temperatures translate into lower viscosities. Uh, you can heat honey up, for example, and it'll pour much more easily than if it's at a relatively cool temperature. And that temperature dependent and viscosity brings us to one of the applications of this particular property. Uh, when you're dealing with motor oil in a car, you might have noticed that motor oil comes in a lot of different varieties, especially if you started driving and maintaining your own vehicle. Those different varieties tend to come in the form of the viscosity of the motor oil itself. Motor oil has to be thick. It has to be thick enough to coat the parts inside your car and close all the seals, all the gaps that might exist in your engine. So a higher viscosity in that situation makes for a better motor oil. However, motor oil must be thin enough to flow freely through your engine. You can imagine if the motor oil is super duper thick, your engine's not going to be able to move it around and pump it through all the different parts and get it to all those pieces. As we already mentioned, viscosity changes with temperature. So not only do you have to consider the the thickness versus the thinness of your oil, you have to, have to consider the fact that at different times of the year, this viscosity is going to change. As a result, motor oil is sold with viscosity information, and your car likely has data inside of it somewhere that tells you what type of viscosity works well for this particular vehicle. There is a group out there known as the Society of Automotive Engineers that have come up with a measuring scale for measuring the thickness of motor oil. And a lot of motor oils we actually buy are blends of different types of oils that get you viscosities uh, at different temperatures to be within the range the car needs. You might notice uh, that on bottles of oil when you purchase them, They'll often have a rating like this down here, 0W20. 
the W rating over here is the cold temperature viscosity, W standing for winter. The 20 over here is the high temperature or the hot temperature viscosity. Uh, when the engine has been running for a while, it's going to be running at much higher temperatures. This gives us a range of viscosities that this oil can operate at, and depending on the design of your car, you're going to get oils with different numbers, 0, 15, 10 uh, for the W value, 20, 30, 40, 50 uh, for the second value. And we can actually see a comparison of those different oil behaviors uh, by looking at them pouring here. We can see we've got 0 W30. These are relatively low numbers for our viscosity, and we can see that when tipped over, this oil pours out very well. And then over here on the other end of the spectrum, we've got 20 W50. This oil is significantly thicker. Those viscosity numbers are higher, and as a result, we can see when we tip this over, the oil hasn't even started moving out of the beaker yet. And we see the spectrum in between. Your car's engine is calibrated to work with different oils at different viscosities, and those numbers are adjustable depending on the place you live in. Up here in New England, we tend to shoot for lower viscosity oils. Down in Florida, they can use higher viscosity, again, because of the big temperature difference. To wrap things up, we'll talk about these last two properties right here, the idea of cohesion versus adhesion. Cohesion is the tendency of liquid particles to be attracted to themselves. Again, this has a lot to do with those intermolecular attractive forces. Adhesion has to do with the tendency of a liquid to be attracted to its container. Again, still intermolecular forces. It just depends on whether those forces are stronger when connecting to other atoms of a like or molecules versus the molecules in the container itself. You can imagine then all liquids have both of these properties, cohesion versus adhesion. In the case of water, which is what's in this first container here at the bottom of the page, we can see, and as we talked about earlier in the year, there is a U-shaped attraction between the water and the uh, actual thing. This means that the water is more attracted to the glass. It has stronger adhesion than it is to itself. To contrast this, something we don't get to see very often is this different liquid. Uh, this, just like in the beginning of the video, is the liquid mercury. Uh, when mercury is poured into a container, it creates this bump. Uh, as opposed to the U-shape that we're normally used to seeing. This tells us that the dominant force in mercury is cohesion. It sticks to itself more than it sticks to the container that it's in, and as a result, it tends to clump together in the center. So that brings us to the end of our video. Uh, at this point in time, you should be able to identify the general characteristics and properties of liquids and solids. We've talked about that twice now, so it should be relatively straightforward. Uh, you should be able to briefly describe uh, the crystal and structure of solids and structures and be able to identify what a unit cell actually is and how that translates into the shape of the structure as a whole. And last but not least, you should be able to discuss the properties we talked about at the end of the video of liquids, namely viscosity, adhesion, and cohesion. Most of this information uh, is very factual. There's not a whole lot to uh, worry about in terms of understanding what's going on here. It's a nice foundation of information to allow us to have better conversations about liquids and solids later on in the unit.